Welcome back to the Forge of Sagas. To finish up Orktober, we're going to be taking this aquarium decoration and turning it into an orky tree fort made out of the wreckage of the ship they came in on. I used a couple of different 3D printed parts in this build and I will leave a list of all of the parts and their sources down in the video description. So without further ado, let's get started. When trying to find a location to build a great tree fort, you need something that's going to be nice and tall and have a lot of support. So when I found this particular piece in my pet store's clearance section, I knew that I'd found some prime real estate for my orcs to take over. This thing measures an impressive 10 and a half inches tall, which is going to end up making this my tallest build to date. However, when you're working with aquarium terrain, there is one big issue and that's all of the holes that were made for the fish to swim through. Obviously great for the fish, not so great for us in terrain building. So we're going to have to fill these in. I started with the circular holes because they were smaller and easier to fill. I just cut some circles out of corrugated cardboard, grabbed my hot glue gun, and secured them in place. I hot glued them from the top instead of the bottom because we're going to use the hot glue to simulate tree rings here. So once you've gotten the initial layer locked in and it dries, you can come in and add another circle of hot glue, just mirroring where you'd already laid it down. While you're doing this, make sure the part you're working on is level with the floor so you don't have any drooping. I learned this from experience, you can start to see the glue droop a little bit here, but if it happens, don't worry about it, it'll still look natural. Here we can see the finished product, just nice concentric rings to a dot in the center. Take your time with this and make sure you let each outer layer dry before you do the next layer so they don't blend together. The two really big holes were not going to be easy to fill with just some corrugated cardboard and hot glue, so I opted to grab some air dry clay instead. This was my first time working with it, but it was honestly really nice. It maintained a lot of flexibility while I was working with it, and it was really easy to smooth out any mistakes that I made. So once I pushed it on and secured it, I came in with one of my sculpting picks and just began to trace some of the lines that already existed on the model to create some continuity and create that broken wood that you would see where the bark has been ripped away. This pairs nicely with the little story I have going with this build where when the orcs crashed onto Space Australia, they hit this tree and then decided, ah, oh, we can build a fort in this. This clay is the air dry variety, so it took about two days for it to fully set. And while I was watching it, it kind of started to droop a little bit. So I grabbed some popsicle sticks and just put that in the back in order to help support it while it dried. Now it's time to combine some conventional scratch building with 3D printed parts. I've got a fountain soda cup here from Wendy's and I've got this little engine exhaust that I printed on my new Ender 3 Pro. By combining the two, we get this really nice spaceship engine shape, which I can then use to mount platforms on later. If you don't have a 3D printer, one thing you could use instead is the cap of a spray paint can. A lot of them have a little ring inside to protect the nozzle, which could be the engine exhaust that you would want from such a thing. But I just couldn't resist the temptation to try out my new 3D printer. So we're going to make a couple of different parts just to add on here and there. The last thing we need to do with the Wendy's cup, however, is trim away the lip. It's one of those little details that make people look and go, that's a soda fountain cup and not a starship engine. Plus it gets in the way when you go ahead and add things in the basing like flocking. It just doesn't stick well to this lip, it gets lost inside. So. We're just going to cut that away. To add a little bit of structural support to the cup, I took some corrugated cardboard and cut out a little brace to go on the inside. Added some hot glue to both sides and then stuffed it down in there. This is going to help later when we go to attach platforms to the cup as when we squeeze it or put pressure on it, it's not just going to collapse in on itself. We're also going to add two little wings to the side. And here's how it looks when it's done. Got a nice little cross shape. And you can see when I press around it, it doesn't really give in at any point. I wanted another layer of security just closer to the base to make sure it maintained that nice circle at the bottom, so I added this circle of corrugated cardboard. When you're working with things with such a thin plastic wall that are really prone to being crushed, I find that adding these internal supports really helps with the overall stability. Now it's time to start adding some details to the engine. I started with this strip of dollar store foam and wrapped it around the top of the engine just to disguise the gap between the 3D printed part and the cup. Wrapped it around measured where I needed to cut it, gave it a little slice with my knife, and then hot glued it in place. Next we're going to make some panels as this is a really nice way to add simple detail and bring out that sci-fi feel. Here I'm using a piece of cardstock, which is essentially just thicker paper, to cut out some basic irregular shapes. 
just kind of going with whatever feels right. I actually chose this after I'd already tried with cereal box cardboard, and what I found was that the cereal box cardboard was a little too inflexible. It wanted to pull up at the edges and not lay perfectly flat. So my search for new material, this is what came up, and I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Once you've cut out your paneling shapes, you just have to decide where they're going to go on the cup, then grab your handy glue stick, and attach them as you see fit. Go ahead and be liberal with the glue as you really want to make sure that this sticks in place, especially along the edges. To add some further difference to the surface, we're going to grab some more of that thin dollar store foam and cut out some more shapes. If I could just get this cup to stay in place, I'll apply some hot glue around the edges of the foam panel and attach it to one of my paper panels. Just to say, okay, here's a layer, here's an interior layer. Again, it just adds to that nice traditional sci-fi look. I also decided to add a little bit of toy piping just to add a little bit more visual interest and a little bit of variety of detail. Just makes the piece look again less like a soda cup and more like an engine. Here we go, we've got all of our panels in place and you can see how this is really starting to take that sci-fi engine shape and not look so much like a soda cup. We're going to turn the camera here a little bit and I'm going to show you guys where this is going to line up on the piece. I'm going to put it here in the back, the cup fits really nicely here, and I figure we can make some kind of platform here that will then connect to a little bit of a higher platform and then lead eventually up to the top. However, the shape of those pipes make it look like a handle, which draws our eye back to the cup thing. So we're going to go ahead and grab the Dremel and trim these down a little bit. This will also help make sure that the pipe doesn't get in the way of anything else we decide to add at a later point. Make sure you wear proper protective equipment when you're working with power tools. In the case of the Dremel, make sure you wear a mask to prevent yourself from breathing in any dust, and make sure that you also wear eye protection just in case the blade should break and a fragment fly at your eyes. It's rare, but it happens. Now it's time to start building some of those platforms we just talked about, and I'm going to start by using some chipboard and the Wylox Armory method. I'm going to support it with this little 3D printed landing strut because eh, orcs don't use landing gear for landing, so it was perfectly fine and intact for us to use in building. Once I'd figured out where the gap needed to be so it would wrap around the tree in the engine, I came with my scissors and I cut it out. This edge I wanted to be a little more regular like it was some kind of balcony that overlooked something within the interior of the ship, but when I go to cut the outside, I'm going to cut that real ragged as though it had been broken off during the crash. Here's the finished product, I'm sorry I don't have the construction footage, but one of the squigs ate it, so you know, sorry about that. But I'll link the Wylox Armory video in the description that I used for this technique. It's just chipboard, cross stitch meshing, and chipboard again. However, what I do have build footage of is the bridge platform. This is from the command part of the ship, so it's going to be a little nicer and not have that graded industrial flooring. So I decided to skip that layer and just go with some Eileen's tacky glue to bind together the two layers of chipboard. Too easy. Next, I grabbed another 3D printed component, which was this bank of computer panels, and hot glued it into place. As you can see, that little weird shape in the cardboard was cut exactly to match this particular piece. I figured the orcs have managed to salvage this piece and are now using it to control this massive cannon. This is going to go on the top of our four, be a little bit of an anti-aircraft gun for any of the other forces that might be trying to fly by and bother them. We're going to start by creating a circular platform for the gun to sit on. That way, in theory, it could rotate. We're going to make this out of a half inch thick piece of pink insulation foam as it's an easy material to get through and it works well with a hot wire cutter that we're going to break out in a minute. Next we're going to come with my compass and then I'm going to turn my compass around so it works properly. Stick it in and we're going to trace this circle. I've offset it by about half an inch because I want to have that extra gap around the outside so we can make two different rings when we get to cutting. But we'll get to that in a second. I then grabbed my Proxon hot wire table and this jig that I got from ShiftingLands.com and used it to cut a perfect circle. There's a nail embedded in the piece of MDF board that I'm working off of and that's what's keeping this piece steady as I rotate it. Really like this piece if you're going to be cutting out any circles, just makes life so much easier. You'll notice that I didn't cut out the line I traced, I cut out just a bigger circle. And why I'm doing that is because I wanted to create an outer ring that would surround the internal rotating platform. Again. Just trying to draw from some sci-fi ships that I've seen, and a lot of them have that little ring that goes around the part of the gun that actually rotates. So, we're going to go ahead and cut that out here. I then backtracked a little on the outer ring and made another cut, just to give a little bit of space between the internal and the external ring. This way, it looks like there's a little more freedom for it to rotate, and it doesn't look like they'd be grating against each other as they try and move. Too easy. Now it's time to build the platform this is going to sit on. 
I'm gonna put some eye beams coming out of the top of the tree to support this, but we'll get to that in a minute. For now, we're going to focus on creating the right size platform. So, came with a pencil and marked it where I thought it was appropriate, and then came in and cut it with my knife. I used my ruler as a guide to make sure that I got a nice straight cut, even though you can see I'm working a slight angle just to give the platform a little bit more variety. Again, this is orc, so right angles, I mean, they're fine, but you know, if we don't have to, then we won't. I grabbed my hot wire cutter again and began to just create some random jagged edges. I figured this platform used to be a part of the hull, which explains why there is a massive cannon mounted on it. You know, it used to be a ship-to-ship -ship gun, now, you know, it's an anti-aircraft gun. Orcs can repurpose anything. So, we're gonna go ahead and make sure that we cut some really nice jagged edges to show where this piece was ripped off from a larger ship. To further reinforce that ragged edge, we're gonna go ahead and adjust the wire angle to about 45 degrees, and go in and create some slight cuts around the edges. This is going to help reinforce that wreckage theme, as we can't really bend this foam as much as I would like, but we can use this effect to give the illusion that at some point, the metal bent, and then it tore, and this is what's left. So, let's go ahead, again, this is to taste, you can do as much as you like, as little as you like, just make sure that it looks right to you. Now it's time to attach our gun mount to the hull. I used this file that had a little point on the end to make sure I had a nice little hole, so I knew where I had to apply all the hot glue. Reloaded my hot glue gun, made sure I put down plenty of it, then used this point to line it up again, pushed it in, and then secured it in place. I then grabbed the outer ring and did the exact same thing. Hot glue, make sure we add a little bit to the inside to hot glue those edges together, and then figure out where it's going to be in place with a little bit of give that hot glue has before it dries. Now it's time to go in and add some detail to our hull. To do this, I grabbed some 3 8 inch dollar store foams, a little bit thicker than the stuff I was using earlier, and cut out some strips. These are just going to add little detail lines, make it look like there was some plating or other sort of design on the hull of the ship that, you know, would have connected to other things, but now it doesn't. Again, we're just adding some visual interest to attract the eye, make things look a little bit more interesting. Once you've got everything conformed to your tears, go ahead and hot glue that in place. Using a little less foam here makes it feel like it was a part of a much bigger design, which helps reinforce that ship hull theme. The next detail we're going to add is some polystyrene pipes. These are a really nice way to add a little bit of detail, and they cut really easily with a pair of clippers, so we can come in and reinforce our torn up look by maiming the end. Just go ahead and attack it with your clippers at some random points, then you can come in and splay out the edges with your fingers to make it look like this pipe was torn or blown apart, depending on how you want it to be. Once you're happy with how the end looks, you can go ahead and hot glue it in place. This is really a matter of taste, just kind of going in and creating your own design. I imagine that it turned off at this angle and then ran down along this little strip here, but you know, you can do this however you like. I'll admit this is one of my favorite parts of the crafting process because I can just go in and be artistic. I don't have to worry about structure or functionality, it's just, does this look cool? And I thought it did. The last little detail we're going to add is these 3D printed pylons. I figure they could represent a mech's custom force field that he's built to protect his mega cannon. So, you know, we're just gonna go ahead and hot glue that in place. One thing to think about when you're positioning things like this is to make sure you're not compromising areas where models could stand. That's why I went ahead and put it in that corner where you really couldn't fit the base of most models anyway. However, for a wreckage, this hull's a little too not full of holes. So we're gonna go ahead and grab a drill bit and make those holes. Go ahead again, this is a to taste thing, be as aggressive as you like. I decided for a couple of blast holes and then a little more scrape and crack damage. But you know, you can go crazy on this, really have fun with it. Now it's time to make those eye beams I talked about earlier. We're gonna go ahead and cut three shapes out of chipboard, one of which is gonna be the centerpiece, and that's gonna have an angle that's suited to support the platform we need. Once that's all good, we're gonna grab some Eileen's tacky glue and glue them all together in the eye beam shape. Once we've got them glued together like this, we're going to go ahead and grab some hot glue and stick them into the holes in our tree. You can just go ahead and stick them in there, and as long as you've cut the top angle right, they'll go ahead and make a nice flat platform for our ship hull to lay on. So, just go ahead and get one on the other side as well, that way we've got two points of support, and then we'll go ahead and grab our platform and test fit it. You can see I obviously did this before I added the detail of the platform, but I wanted to finish off talking about that platform before I moved on to other things. Now it's time to go in and create some popsicle stick I-beams to support the command platform. On this side, there really wasn't anything to keep it supported while I tried to measure this, so instead I turned the piece on its side, 
That way gravity wouldn't be fighting me the entire time. I kept making really small adjustments to the popsicle sticks in order to make sure that I didn't overcut and then have to get a new popsicle stick. This was a very time consuming process in order to make sure I got all of the angles right, but eventually I came in and built three different sets of girders and combined them with some Eileen's tacky glue and then hot glued them onto the tree. And here they are when they're finished. I went a little bit overboard with the hot glue, but you can always come in and scrape that away with your knife, so it's not too much of a concern. Now we've got our computer bank and we've got our massive cannon, so they're going to need to draw power from somewhere. I didn't want to build a whole power generator, I figured that could also be a really cool orky building to do as a part of this larger complex. So instead we're going to build ourselves a little transformer. I liked the shape the barrel of this baby nerf gun had, so I grabbed my dremel and cut away the handle. Then I grabbed the sanding tool and sanded away any of the obvious logos like the nerf logo and the caution, you know, do not point at face, all those things that we have definitely never done with a nerf gun. My favorite thing about this is that my toy plastic pipes fit perfectly down the barrel where the darts are supposed to go. I didn't end up using this configuration, but it makes for a nice demo of why I really like that shape. With all the components created, it's time to bring this project together on a base. I cut the base out of a quarter inch thick MDF board and sanded the edges to a nice bevel using my orbital sander. I then came in and grabbed all my components and kind of test fitted them again to see exactly where I wanted this laid out. I had a general idea when I cut it, but again, you just want to make sure that you line everything up before you glue things in place. So, once I was happy with where this was sitting, came in with my sharpie and traced out exactly where I wanted to glue it down, then grabbed my hot glue gun and glued everything in place. Once you've got all your hot glue applied, just go ahead and line it up right above the lines that you've drawn and press it down into place. The last prep thing we have to do is to seal all of our paper and foam components, and for that we're going to be using some Mod Podge. Grab an old brush and make sure that you apply a very liberal layer across all of these surfaces. For the foam piece, this is going to protect it from any of the chemicals that are in the propellant of the spray paint that we're going to use to prime it, that way we don't get any damage that we didn't put there intentionally. For the paper products, this will prevent it from warping due to absorbing moisture from paints and washes that we're going to add later. I also added a thick layer of Mod Podge to the base in order to secure my flocking. Usually I'd use white PVA glue for this, but as it turns out, I was out of PVA glue and I needed to get this project finished, so Mod Podge it is. Still works like PVA glue, still has an adhesive quality, so we're just going to go ahead and spread that out all over the base. Once the Mod Podge is in place, we're going to come in with some sand and add some texture to the base. Go ahead and be nice and liberal with this, as long as you put some newspaper down under it, you'll be able to recover it all at the end, so I say go crazy. Make, just make sure that you really get some nice coverage. You can always go ahead, pour it off, check it, and then add a little bit back on with your hands if you see there's areas where you didn't quite catch it, like I did just right on the edges. Then once you're done, grab your newspaper, fold it all up, and pour the sand right back into your container. Too easy. When I woke up the next morning and it had all dried, I realized there was a little bit more of a gap between the base of the tree and the base that I didn't quite like. So I grabbed some spackle and came in to blend that in. You can see I'm having a little bit of trouble with the spackle here because there's not enough water in it. So came back and fixed that and then went about spackling around all the edges just to smooth out the transition a bit more between the ground and the tree so that it makes it look like the tree is actually in the ground as opposed to glued on top of it. After that had dried, I primed it with some white spray paint because that's what I had laying around, and then I started painting. I started with a base layer of burnt umber on any of the exposed wood, as well as all of the metal components. This is going to help give it a nice dark undertone that's going to form the base for all the layers we're going to add on later. Obviously for my orcs, they live on a planet that I simply call Space Australia. So I drew some inspiration from some of the trees that you see in the outback, many of which have a much lighter color bark. So, to start, we're going to give it this little bit of a light tan undercoat. This is going to help provide some shadows and a little bit of warmth that you would get from the outback sun. While I let that dry, I came in with some blush brown and applied it to the base. This is going to help give it that very outback ground feel, and you know, lets me take advantage of the dry time. Whilst one thing is drying, I can work on something else. Just makes the process a little more efficient. Now we can turn our attention back to the tree and I came with a layer of a much cooler gray just to offset some of the warmth of the beige. The tree bark should still be white at the end of the day, so I wanted to make sure I got really good coverage of this and only left the beige in the deepest recesses of the tree. 
That way it would be there, but it wouldn't be the prominent color. To finish things up, I came in with a layer of pure white and just dry brushed that over the top to really brighten up the tree. This is gonna help accent those high points and really give it that white bark that I want. The whole bark was a little bit too bright and monochromatic though for me. So I grabbed some peppercorn gray and made some striations on it, similar to what you would see in a birch bark tree. It's always got these little black lines where the bark is a little cracked. So I figured a little bit similar detail might look good on this tree. And I really think it added just that extra little bit of something that it was missing. With such light bark, having a really dark interior wood just didn't look right anymore. So I came in with this much lighter brown and just applied it everywhere where there was exposed wood. Grabbed a much smaller brush at this point because I didn't want to wreck all the work I had previously done on making this bark look really nice. With the trees sorted for now, we're going to turn our attention to all of the platforms. And I wanted them to be a little bit brighter than my normal really grungy gunmetal. So I grabbed some galvanized tin craft paint instead and gave a fairly heavy overbrush to any of the metal areas. While it's definitely a little brighter than some of my other builds, there's still enough brown showing through the overbrush that it gives it this nice weathered feel that really fits in nice with the grimdark setting of Warhammer 40k. With the metal sorted, it's time to add some color, and instead of using normal color theory, we're going to use orc color theory. And because this is a spaceship and spaceships need to go fast, we're going to paint it red, because as every good orc knows, red things are the fastest. So we're going to go with this heritage brick red and go ahead and paint out some of the details across different platforms. On the engine, I went with this lip here, as well as some of the base platforms we made out of the cardstock leaving the raised platforms for a different color later. Here you can see I did the same thing on the gun, just picking out a couple of details here and there. I then came in with this antique bronze and created some more highlights. I know what it is about this like really grungy metal bronze and this heritage brick red color that I've really liked, but I think it really comes together. This picture is from a little bit early in the scheme, I've obviously got some cleanup work to do. But I wanted to show you guys here how I'm picking out just little details with the bronze and leaving the majority of it with the base tin. Over on the command deck, after putting in a red floor with some bronze accents and dry brushing the console bronze just to paint all those buttons really quickly because that would have been a pain otherwise, I came in with some Games Workshop Contrast Warp Lightning to paint the screens. I like the slight translucent nature of the contrast paint which lets the underlying metal shine through because it gives the screens just that little bit of shimmer and life. So just go ahead and go with two thick layers of this and you'll get a nice little green screen, kind of like you get in the Fallout games. I wanted to give the shield pylons and the massive cannon a little bit of an energy glow. And I decided to go with green because again, or color theory, green is the best. So I opted for this really light green undercoat as it's going to give us a nice base to build our glow effect on. On the cannon, I chose some of the recessed areas where it would make sense for light to be emanating from and very, very carefully, with a very, very small brush, painted the green in there. It took a couple of layers to get it perfect, but this is one of those things where I really wanted to take my time and get it right. Once everything had dried, I grabbed some Warp Lightning Contrast again and applied it to any of the energy areas out of shot, and I apologize for that. So we'll jump to the pylon where it's already done, and then I came in and applied a dry brush of the same light green to help bring back that glow over the darker base coat. With all the colors sorted, it's time for washes. For the wood, I went with a brown wash, but you want to be really careful when you're doing this. If you use a very liquidy wash like I have here, this is the Black Magic Craft variety, link will be in the description, and make sure that it doesn't run onto your nice white bark if you're doing something like this. If you got brown bark, eh, it's not going to matter as much, but on this, it's going to stain it a really dark brown color and you'll have to go in and repaint it, so just be careful while you're doing this step. On any of the metallic components, I came in with a black wash just to help tie everything together and make it a little bit more grim dark, a little bit more dull and grimy without adding that really rusted texture that I've used in some of my previous builds. You can also see here on the ship engine where I decided to pick out bronze details over the red and I think it looks really nice. So just make sure you apply this really liberally everywhere and then leave it to dry. Having painted everything in a sub-assembly, it's time to assemble this piece for real. I started with the ship engine as all the other components were built to kind of fit around it, so it was very easy to use it as a focal point to make sure that everything had lined up properly. I just hot glued everything into place, taking my time, you know, making sure everything is lined up properly, making sure there's not too much overflow of hot glue to the point where I'd have to come in and paint over it, just being really delicate and making sure that everything conforms to the way I want it to be. 
However, you'll remember I have this power transformer, but I haven't shown you how the pipes are going to lay out yet, and that's because I didn't really know until I got to this point. I knew I wanted to connect both the command console and the gun to this point, as well as have one pipe going into the ground that would in theory connect to our Orky power plant later. So I came in and glued the transformer in place first, but did not glue the command platform in place. This is going to give me a little bit of freedom to operate and move things around and make those slight adjustments that are going to be needed to fit everything together. A neat trick I learned during this project is that if you need painting handles to help you paint the pipes, you can use the other pipes as painting handles. Now it's time to get all these things off the painting handles and into position. The one going into the ground is pretty simple, so we'll leave that for now, and start with our one that's going to connect to the command console. It fits really nicely into that little triangle shape, so once we've got everything lined up, we're going to go ahead and apply some hot glue, but because I rotated the whole terrain piece, I wanted to make sure I did one last dry fit before I came in and secured it in place. Started with the platform, made sure everything lined up one last time, a little bit more hot glue to stick that pipe on. At this point, we'll also stick on the one going into the ground just to make sure that's stable before we turn our attention to the big platform on the top. We're going to apply some hot glue to the pipe and the eye beams, but the pipe isn't going to quite reach up to the platform yet because there's just no way to make that height work properly, so we just have to push it up a little bit and then secure it in place on the bottom with a little bit of hot glue. When it came to the top, I decided that I wasn't actually going to glue the cannon in place. This would allow me to rotate it if I was doing a narrative mission, you know, it had to be pointed a certain way before it fired. Or, you know, I could also take it off and use it as a landing pad for some death copters or whatever. You know, it just gives me some variety of use in the terrain, and I think it's really cool. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't put in any ladders to connect these platforms, and that's because we're not going to use ladders. We're going to go in a free Buddha's piratey tradition and use cargo nets instead. This is a weird canvassy plastic cross stitching mesh that one of my neighbors was going to throw out and gave to me because she knows I'm doing this sort of stuff. And I figured it would look cool, just be a little different than the ladders I normally use. I took some light brown paint and a brown wash just to give it a little bit more of that natural rope color. Now there are a couple of ways you could secure this in place, but where I had this big thick block of foam, I just decided to grab two short nails and just push them into the foam to secure it in place. I don't know, it's just one of those things that felt very orky, and I liked it. However, the true metallic of the nails didn't quite line up with the metallic paint that I'd put on everything else, so we're gonna go in and just give them a quick little paint with some of that tin. However, where there wasn't enough material for me to go through and drive in a nail, I just added enough hot glue to stick things in place, and then took some of those nail beads that I like to use as rivets, and use them as the top of the bolts that are holding these cargo nets in place. There's going to be a little bit of cleanup needed here just to remove any of the excess hot glue, but it'll still look really nice and give it that bolted together ramshackle feel that orcs are known for. Remember to make sure you come in with a little bit of metallic paint and paint those nail beads in to match the rest of your color scheme. And with those final details added, our orky tree fort is now complete. This is definitely a really fun build to work on as it just brought a lot of different things together with the 3D printing, some more traditional crafting components, and new materials like the air dry clay that I'd never worked with before. This was by far my tallest build with it topping out at 17 inches tall from the top of the cannon to the bottom of the base. So, you know, that's fun too. If you guys enjoyed this build, give us a like and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date on all of our future projects. If there's anything you'd like to see me tackle, be that specific faction terrain, or an idea that you've always had that you want to see me try, feel free to leave it in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again the next time we ignite the Forge of Sagas.